Hello, good afternoon, it's noon on the East Coast. Pat Zemer here with Magna Wave with my guest today, Rosny Napravnik. Uh, very Rosny Napravnik, sharp. <laughs> it's, all, to put, it's all relative. <laughs> it's all relative, absolutely. Uh, Rosie, we've been very fortunate to work with Rosie for the last year or so uh, on her own endeavor with her horses and certainly with Joe Sharp with his horses uh, at, at the racetrack. And so Rosie has recently become very interested in work, not recently, which she will share with us, but for a long time dealing with retired racehorses and wanting to give the uh, racehorses a second purpose in life after their racing career. And so we want to talk about that this morning or today uh, with Rosie about what her uh, activities are and what's going on and how she's approaching it and we want to take your questions if you have any questions you want you can put them in the chat box on the Facebook page or if you'd like you can send a text I believe the numbers up on the screen that you can send a text uh, to us and then we will phone you back and you can ask your question and we can have a conversation uh, with Rosie about whatever it is you might want to talk about her endeavors with the retired racehorses with the breed Cup coming up, anything of that nature that might be interesting for you to talk about. First thing I want to tell you to do, though, or ask you to do, is to share this. Uh, go to your, uh, go to the bottom here and share this with your friends, so the fr people that you know can uh, see that we're having this conversation and can uh, join us as well. So, with that, Rosie, I want to ask you a question, if I may. And I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question, but it's a good, it's, a, it's not a hard question. <laughs> it occurred to me yesterday we had the Equestricon. Uh, at the convention center with a lot of great exhibitors and good um, uh, clinics that they were having and you were on a couple of the panels discussing things and asking answering questions of people and it, it occurred to me um, seeing you and other jockeys that were there and just thinking the whole process through what goes through your mind when we get to Breeders Cup season or Derby season uh, you're certainly of an age that you could be riding if you desire to be riding today uh, and you're riding so you're working out you're staying in in relative shape maybe different than what you'd be on the racetrack but what goes through your mind when all this is happening and you're seeing all this activity and you're sitting there I watched you at the one round desk they had sitting with other jockeys and people were asking questions signing autographs what goes through your mind what goes through my mind now or when, no, I was now, when you think about that and maybe when you were riding maybe you can give us both well I mean it's much different now um, I, I still what people don't realize is even though I'm not um, riding anymore my husband trains a very large string of horses right. um, at the premier tracks around the country and so he actually has um, two starters in the Breeders Cup um, his probably his uh, highlighted one would be Moms on Strike in the Philly Mare Turf on Saturday. Um, <clears throat> so there's a whole lot of excitement. Breed and having Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs right in our backyard is, first of all, very convenient. And oh, yeah. second of all, you know, we get to enjoy all the festivities of all the week. It's kind of the same as Derby Week. And it's just everyone's getting, you know, hyped up about all the different horses and watching their workouts and watching them train every morning. And, you know, everyone's, we've got cameras in the barn area trying right. to showcase all the horses. So it's, it's so much excitement going on and it's really for me it's really enjoyable to watch it all from the back seat having been there done that right. knowing the excitement that right. Joe's going through because it's his horse in the in the Breeders Cup um, but being able to watch it from the back seat and just enjoying it is really cool for me but do you have that I want to go do this again um <laughs> on days like the Breeders Cup sure yeah. You know, um, and I actually was galloping Moms on Strike at the racetrack this past winter at the fairgrounds. So she's a horse that I know well and love, and everybody in the barn loves her. And you know, I I'm have the pleasure and the privilege to kind of step back into the barn whenever I feel like it at the right. racetrack, right. and you know, go and gallop over the winter if I want to. And when I'm there, I've finally gotten over my <coughs> um, my super humble approach and i've decided that you know i can take full advantage of the trainer's wife rock star set list and get on only the very best horses <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so um it's really enjoyable when i do get to go and gallop at the track and um <clears throat> Joe's really excited to have me there um, at, at the fairgrounds, and I'm really excited to get back in the barn uh, at the fairgrounds this year. But um, it's, you know, it, sure, I miss it. I, you know, I get, but I get just as excited, and it's just as rewarding 
for Joe to go be going through oh, you yeah. know, all this excitement and Absolutely. having this success. And it's really fun for me to watch him and his career grow and have so much success. That, you know, that's cool. And you mentioned that being able to, to be back and take a look at it. And one of the things that we're going to discuss is with the retired thoroughbreds. But I'm sure that, that Joe enjoys having your eye and your knowledge when you get on those horses and ride to be able to give him some feedback that maybe he doesn't always get. Yeah, I mean, Joe was actually, he was a jockey himself, and right. he is one of the very few trainers who actually rides his own horses on the racetrack, and he was actually bored for Moms on Strike's Final Breeze. Um, really? I didn't realize he was yeah. doing that stuff. Oh, yeah, no, he breezes her himself every week, and, um, I mean, she's a horse that's pretty easy to gallop, so anybody could ride her, but it's always, you know, and it's always great to have your, your best person on your best horses. Um, so I think um, that was an asset for him, too, as well, when we went to the Derby a uh, couple years ago right. with Gervin. I think he really valued having my opinion on that horse, and, you know, I've ridden horses of that class before, and um, just to have that... <clears throat> you know um insight from a jockey's point perspective and you know having ridden those horses before i think he really values that so that it, it, we could have a whole conversation just on the training aspect and and just one quick little question here before we get going with maybe questions from our viewers uh when he rides that really gives him an advantage Oh, yeah. When he talks to the jockey that's going to ride the horse. Oh, yeah. And he would ride every single horse if he could. Um, he, You know, he's sometimes when he's riding, it, you know, takes away from him being able to see all of the horses being right. ridden. Right. Um, but it, it's a huge advantage for him to breeze different horses. You know, if, it, you know, he breeze this one this week and breeze a different one next week, that sort of thing. Um, it just, it gives him a whole other perspective that if you're not riding the horses, you wouldn't have. That's incredible, and 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 to that end also, I mean, we're here to talk about you and where you're going with with your interests with with the uh, off track thoroughbreds, and but it's just interesting to see how you're you're tying together. Tell us a little bit about a lot of people who watch this and view this will have some idea of your background, but give us a little idea where you came from, how you became interested in this, what disciplines you've participated in, and and that'll give us a lead to where we're going. I grew up in Bedminster, New Jersey, um, which is a very uh, New Jersey. Northern New Jersey is a very rural horse country um, area. Uh, uh, my mother was uh, has been an eventing trainer and coach my entire life, um, so I was lucky to have such good influence from the very, very beginning. Um, and I probably started competing when I was about four years old. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I did everything from lead line in, at Devon Horse Show, which is a huge horse show um, in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, started in the short stirrup kind of stuff. On a, I had a little twelve hand pony. It was a fabulous pony. Um, and then uh, you know, I got into eventing, of course, naturally because that's what my mother was doing. Um, and I loved cross country. You know, from from the very first time I was able to be set free on cross country, that was right, ideal. Right. Right. Um, if anything, it was probably dressage that steered me <laughs> away from the eventing. As a kid, you know, that's the, the boring part. And, and now that I'm getting back into it, that's the challenging and exciting part. Is the dressage. The dressage. You know, it's just something that I, you know, wasn't, it wasn't my favorite part when I was younger. And now that I'm, now that I'm getting back into it in, in this second career of mine, um, it's the challenging part, and it but it's fun because it's really cool to see the horses develop, and and you know things click with them. And, and dressage, from my perspective, has kind of stepped up. Years ago, when I was around, they've changed with the the music they're using, the routines are, are getting more upbeat with with yeah. how they're going, and and so that to me that brings a lot of people into it. Yeah, for who, sure. Who it's maybe a didn't great understand way. before. Yeah, no, there's a um, there's a YouTube clip, and I would have to look at it to even know the names. But um, a very, very, very high level of freestyle dressage to like a, a real, real hip hop song, and it's really so cool. And it's one of those things that gets you excited about right. dressage. So, I mean, it's something that I really you know put a lot of focus on and and uh, enjoy doing now. Um, but anyway, getting back to where when I started, right. um, I competed in eventing, and um, and then for several years I was uh, I rode my first pony race when I was seven, and um, there's not a lot of people that actually know about pony racing. They they hold them at the steeplechase meets, 
um, huh. which are predominantly on the East Coast is where the steeplechasing is most popular, and they hold the pony. I mean, they're organized pony races. We have, we have lead line trot races, which my two and three year old sons have participated in. Three I was just going to ask how the boys races. are doing. Okay. Yep, they they participate in three lead line trot races. Then you have Shetland pony races. So there's like the little idiot bittiest ponies. Right. Then you have small ponies of any breed, medium ponies, large ponies, and junior horse races, and also field master chases, which is like an introduction into steeple chasing. So there's tons of opportunities for kids in racing on the East Coast, particularly. Um, and my sister and I were very serious into that um, for several years. Um, I also, uh, in in trying to sell one of our ponies, who actually, um, year you know years before had been uh, rescued from the slaughter pipeline, it was a really cool pony, and um, we had competed him in eventing, racing, jumper the whole spiel um but it was you know i was growing out of him i was the youngest and last child and um <clears throat> we were getting ready to move and so it was time to finally move this pony on and so we um we com i competed him in the pony jumper circuit in 2000 and we actually went all the way to the finals and finished seventh in the finals wow. so we had a really great campaign so um i have in, in through pony club too which i participated in most of my childhood um I always enjoyed uh, mounted games. Was one of my favorite things. If you've ever, if you don't know what mounted games are, you got to YouTube that. So fun. Mounted games. Mounted games. Yeah. Um, it's like relay races on ponies with, oh, with kids. Okay. Yeah, it's fabulous. Um, uh, I did vaulting. I did hunters, jumpers, dressage, eventing. Um, you name it. Polo cross. You know, just Pony Club is such a fantastic organization that you know exposes kids into so many different uh, disciplines and avenues that they can pursue in horses so um, coming up in you know in the pony club and so there was racing taking place there was racing taking place all along right and it was the racing that really captured me um, and that is where you know we, we started to um, right as we got into the the mounted games we sort of got kicked out because we ended up not being there any weekend you know we were missing practices and we were missing all the pony club stuff because we were off racing and that's just where it you know ventured right. off into so um that was what we wanted to pursue my sister um she's six years my senior and she uh went on to be a steeple become a steeplechase jockey and then trainer and you know i was just tunnel vision toward the flat track and so that's where i ended is up is she still involved in steeplechase oh, yeah. yep okay yeah she trains steeplechase horses and um she fox hunts she um, another thing that uh you know she helped expose me to uh, a little bit later and when we were started working with the steeplechase horses um they they do a lot of fox hunting over the winter when it's kind of like their off season um, so she she trains steeplechase horses, and she also you know she sold a couple of horses off the track. Um, you know she has the same background in all those right. other equestrian and, and you, sports. So you were going flat track. Yep. And she. What age? When did when did that start? That you ran your first my race? My first professional race. I was seventeen. Okay. June 9th, two thousand and five. So it was just at the end of my junior year in high school. Wow. And, whew, I'm aging myself. <laughs> <laughs> two thousand and five. And and where was that? At Pimlico Racecourse Pim in Maryland, in and Baltimore. How, how'd you do? I won. Really? Yes, yes. Um, I was working. Uh, my my very first gallop job on the racetrack was for Dickie Small, um, <clears throat> and it, it was actually I would worked for him for less than a year, and I had all plans of you know I w I was living I would always go and live with my sister for the summers. Um, from the time I was 13, I think, was the first time I went with my sister for the summer and had a gallop job. And um, so I was with her for the summer and working for Dickie. And at the end of the summer came, um, this is when I was 16, between my sister Jazz, Dickie, and the woman that I was living with, Holly Robinson, who is actually my sister's boss, um, they were sort of my mentors and the people that were looking out for me while I was away from my parents. And, you know, they collaboratively were sort of like, uh, we think you should stay and pursue your career. Like, you know, they, they could see my, my drive and my, you know, my commitment to it. And they said, you know, they were like, you maybe should think about staying here so that you could continue. Um, you know, working on your career. And so um, we actually, uh, 
there was I was so in between what am I gonna do I was planning to go back to New Jersey and finish my last year of high school with my friends and all that um, but then I had this whole you know career sitting mm -hmm. here like sort of on a platter with some really good people trying to support me so I was really in between what was I gonna do and it ended up being like two weeks after the school year had started in Maryland and it had the school hadn't started in New Jersey yet so um, but it's two weeks after it started I emailed the principal and I said this is what I need to do these are the hours I can come to school can you help me out if you can't I'm gonna have to drop out and so they arranged for me to be in a program where it's actually a senior program where you go to school half day to get those credits and then the other half a day you're spent working um, in whatever internship mm -hmm you know you're doing or whatever um, so they allowed me to be in that senior program and then I had to um, make up for those credits I was missing because I was only a junior at night school so I was going to school I was galloping at the racetrack from 530 to about 9 or 10 going to high school um, public high school from 11 to 230 and then I went to night school from 6 to 10 three nights a week so it was <laughs> it was a lot of commitment to keep myself so all right said and done, I know there's a lot of people that find themselves, particularly today with all the sports activities and things going on and kids are excelling in, in a lot of different things, was that a good thing? I mean, do you sit back and look at it today? I think it was a crazy thing for a junior to accomplish. I mean, when I think about the miles I drove, the hours I slept, <laughs> oh my! I mean, and the amount that I worked, I mean, I worked seven days a week too. It wasn't just, you know, during the school week that I was working. I mean, and, you know, I would come into school and I'm exhausted from, you know, being up since 4.30. So, I mean, it was a, it was a big commitment. Um, and, and I, for part of that, I didn't even have my driver's license. I was hustling rides everywhere, <laughs> you know? So it was a big commitment for me and it was a big commitment for the people that were supporting right. me. For so. family and everybody. Yeah, and absolutely. Everybody concerned. Yeah. Okay. So then you went on and you, you've had one of the most illustrious careers as a female jockey. Um, I, I, I read a year or so ago that after you had been off the track for a couple of years, you were still ranked in the top 15 or top 20 jockeys I don't know the stats where but that's it sounds familiar today. yeah I mean, <laughs> I it, it was I'm incredible sure that after being off track for a couple of years at that time to still be in the top 15 uh, at that time without racing and, and so you've had an illustrious career you retired after your Breeders Cup win yes um, your last Breeders Cup win yep I won the uh, the 2014 Breeders Cup distaff um, six weeks pregnant and the following day was my last day racing isn't that amazing? It was amazing. Now, did you win? Actually, the today is the anniversary of that day. Really? <laughs> it, was on, it was on Halloween, and I I made the announcement on TV, which I wasn't planning on doing. But I ended up making the announcement in the winter circle, and my husband was out trick or treating with his daughter, and he had no idea that I was going to announce it, and he just started getting all these congratulatory texts. Oh. <laughs> so it was this big unplanned public announcement. Right. Was that the same same year you won the last Oaks that you ran? It was the. Same year, I think. Yes, I, yes. Because Untappable won it as a three. Right, year. right. So that was that was a big year, and, and then you retired, and of course worked with your children, your child Carson, correct? Carson and Tucker. Right, a and so what inspired you? I know people were asking you to come back to race, right? And they still are. Still are. <laughs> I was going to ask you that earlier if you're still getting approached to come back and. and <clears throat> well, and it's race. more. Uh, it's a lot more fans that are like, well, "Are you coming back?" You know, and um, you know, I I just had so many exciting moments in my career. So, it, and well, are my you? family. Are you? I am not. I okay. am not coming back. <laughs> if I was going to do that, I surely would have done it already. <laughs> and or she'd announce people, it today. <laughs> after I had my son, my first son, um, that you know everyone was very publicized about me being pregnant. Um, after I had my first son, everyone was like, "Oh, now she's coming." back and then right. I was like what's she pregnant again and then, well she's having her kids get them out of the way so now she can come back it's like no that's not the plan plan was to have two kids and never to come back so I mean you never say never but right that's right. you know okay. hadn't been part of the plan we, okay. we jumped straight into a new chapter of our lives and there. Joe and in all in that same season where I um, found out I was pregnant retired won the Breeders Cup um, Joe actually went from being an assistant to uh, starting his own string right he so was with Mike Maker correct he was with Mike Maker's assistant for right. uh, four years I think um, and then went out on his own about a month before we found out I was pregnant oh wow yeah I mean, we look back at that and we're like what the hell were we thinking <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but um so he went out on his own and so that was like a whole there was just so much going on we went through probably three life changes in three months wow <laughs> you know so it was it was a fun exciting crazy time so then the kids are growing up saw him last night at the halloween festivities but the kids are growing up um what inspired you to get involved with the off track thoroughbreds I and mean, i can see from your your history and all of that but just um, I, in 2008, actually, I had fallen in love with a horse that I rode on the racetrack. I rode him seven times and won twice. Um, and I just fell in love with this horse. And there was a, there was a trainer who was claiming at the track, he was getting back into the business mm -hmm. and he was just on a claiming spree and he wasn't necessarily the type of trainer that I would have sent my horse to, let's just say. Um, if I had a horse, that's not who I would choose. So this, this trainer was just on a claiming spree to build up a stable. And um, my, the horse that I had fallen in love with is Old Ironsides. And he was bred to be a pretty nice horse and ran in some nice races, but had a bunch of injuries. And so he worked his way down to the lowest level. Um, he got down to the lowest level, and so now he was, you know, very claimable right. and was claimed by this trainer and so I was really distraught that the trainer claimed him and moved him to a different racetrack in you know in a different state and so I put him in my little virtual stable and I kept track of him and you know I just made it made it aware that I was very eager to give him a forever home when he was retired right um, so I was very fortunate to be able to do that and um, he retired on Labor Day in 2008 uh, was the last day he ran he had a couple of months off and I sent him to my mom, who uh, was running a boarding and training facility in Maryland. And I was still in the, you know, midst of my career, just traveling and riding all over the place. So I sent him to her and I said, retrain him, reschool him, compete him, use him for your lessons, do whatever you want with him. I want to come whenever I have time and just go cross country. <laughs> you know, I just right. wanted to be my fun horse. Right. And so that's what we did. And, you know, she's fabulous at restarting horses and, um, so she did a great job with him and I would come down and I had started dating Joe a couple of years later and so I bring him down and we I would take him out on this crazy ride jumping things that he's never jumped before <laughs> and you know he would he's an excellent rider without any jumping experience he would just hold on tight um but that horse was really what inspired me to you know he was really what exposed me to the transition that they make from the racetrack I mean he was the type of horse on the racetrack where he you know he tried his heart out every time um, he did his best he wasn't all that fast at the end um, but he still tried and you know just a, a, a great all-around horse on the racetrack and then you know here he is off the track and he's just so happy to be learning new things and doing new things and you know um, Again, trying his heart out, always, you know, eager to please and very willing. And um, that is what inspired me to think about, you know, doing that again. And so um, a couple of years later, I was um, introduced to Michael Blowen, who is the founder uh, of Old Friends, uh, Thoroughbred Retirement, uh, which is an organization that just retires horses. They don't retrain them. Um, they have stallions such as Silver Charm and um, Alphabet Soup. They have Game on Dude. They have, um, they're the only um, retirement organization, I think, that takes stallions. And they have taken stallions back from Japan after they're done breeding. Um, and so I was introduced to Michael and his fabulous organization. Right. And I was just like, oh my gosh, there's this whole world of like people that are just out to help these horses. Um, then, you know, I started to become more aware of a lot of the, the uh, aftercare organizations, uh, New Vocations being one of them. And um, I just started to try to get a little bit involved in finding out what was going on with this, you know, aftercare industry. Um, and it's just skyrocketed since then. Um, Anna Ford from, uh, actually no, it was Stuart Pittman from uh, from the Retired Racehorse Project had asked me to participate in the Thoroughbreds for All event in 2013. Because um, I had some stuff with uh, my horse, Old Ironsides, who I renamed Sugar, because he's such a sweetheart. 
um i had some stuff on facebook you know me riding him and mm -hmm. stuff and so people saw that and so Stuart asked me if i would do this demonstration um i did that that was held at the new vocations facility um so i was a little bit involved with anna ford and their you know their organization and then i just kind of like have <sighs> branched out to kind of support any and all of them um throughout the rest of my career and since retiring i've just sort of taken on uh, joe and i also in the crazy years after my retirement um bought a farm 45 acres in simpsonville kentucky which right. is right in between uh churchill and keeneland and so we have we have acquired our own old friends facility <laughs> where we have tons of joe's retired horses and um, i understand it's like a zoo out there it, it's somewhat like a zoo we have <laughs> we do have chickens and rabbits and goats and horses and ponies and dogs and anything you can think of um, <clears throat> so we have our facility out there and it, it wasn't much of a, of a facility when we bought it. So we've really developed it into a place where we can rehab and retrain horses. And, um, I have sort of being, his, being Joe's assistant was very, very, um, I enjoyed it very much. And it was, um, it was great for getting back into the horsemanship of that I learned so long ago and mm -hmm. hadn't used while I was a jockey because all I was doing was getting on and getting off of horses. Um, but the hours were crazy, crazy, crazy hours. Um, most underpaid and overworked position on the racetrack probably. But um, so after being his assistant for a while, I have pretty much just moved to the farm and you know, I take a lot of his horses for rehab and I have my own horses that are coming off the track and laying up and, um, and then restarting them. And so um, another branch off from the uh, aftercare was the Retired Racehorse Project and the Makeover. And so I've been regularly participating in the Makeover and just have started my own business so I, it kind of makes sense now I, what your interest certainly with with the first horse that you worked with retirement but then taking care of Joe's horses at, yeah, the, at mean, the farm mm -hmm. and, which most people don't do they send them to somebody else to lay them up right right and so they come to your own facility and so you can monitor them he can monitor them you can do that and then natural progression would be all those horses didn't go back to the track right and so you got to figure what am I going to do with them right. how am I repurpose them so I can see where all of that developed into the retired uh, racehorse uh, situation then you competed there last this year and, and last year. Um, I've competed three, years. three um, years the first year was in 2014 where I actually partnered with the Makers Mark Secretariat Center which is another fabulous mm -hmm. aftercare organization one of my favorites um, we partnered on a horse and um, I trained the horse jointly with um, the Secretariat Center and one of their board members, Dorothy Kroll, um, actually did most of the training with the horse. Um, this was actually the year that I was pregnant with my first son. Okay. So we, you know, this, actually how it came about was Stuart Pittman called me and asked me if I wanted to be on the board of the Retired Racehorse Project and I told him, I said, yes, I love to use, you know, my name in, in any way that I can that would help promote what you're doing but I'm going to be the most useless board member you have ever had because I don't participate in board meetings. You know, like I've got so many things going on and this is just my experience, you know, so far. So he's like, okay, that's fine. You know, you can do this, you can do that, you know, maybe show up at this or whatever. You can train a horse for the makeover. And I was like, oh, well, I'd like to do that. And so, but I was pregnant. So I partnered with the Secretariat Center and we, you know, went out looking for a horse and the plan was that, you know, they would train it for the first part and then I would train it for the second part and compete it after I'd had my son. So, so um, we found a fabulous horse called Dare Me who was donated to the Secretariat Center by um, my Meadowview Stable. And he was a fabulous horse, is a fabulous horse. Um, and so Dorothy did most of his training in the beginning and then I uh, started riding him in the fall leading up to the makeover and we competed and I believe we finished 14th and he was fabulous. He was so good. Um, it was probably, you know, my lack of experience with him and, you know, just getting back into eventing that prevented us from doing even better. Um, he's since been sold and, and doing great things. Um, on the eventing circuit here in Kentucky. So I, I competed him in 2014 with Dorothy Kroll and the Makers Mark Secretariat Center. And then last year in 2017, 
um, I actually competed one of Joe's horses. Um, Aztec Brave was a horse that he claimed for 30000 and trained him for, I believe, two year, two to three, two years, maybe. Um, he claimed him for 30000 He ended up winning three stakes with him, and I think he was only less than second or third one other time. Um, and he was retired with a minor suspensory um, injury. And um, So he was a multi three or four hundred thousand dollars. He was one winner. of the, yeah, he had earned over a hundred thousand and he was one of the top earners in the makeover that year. Um, and I think the top ten, in, somewhere in the top ten. Um, so he's a really nice horse. And he was a small horse too, he was really kind of unassuming. He wasn't necessarily one that I would have picked. Right. But, um, the reason I ended up training him was uh, he was owned by Brad Grady, who's one of our best, greatest owners um, and, and good friends. And they knew that it was kind of, Aztec was kind of one of Joe's favorite horses. And so time came to retire him. They did all the layup and, and you know, rest and rehabilitation after his injury. And then they decided to give him to Joe. So we were like, what is he going to do? What are we going to do with those other horses? You know, we've, we're there stacking up. What are we going to do with them? <laughs> Um, he wasn't really the type that you would say, oh, let's make him a pony, because that's what Joe does with a lot of his horses that he's retired, is make him a pony at the racetrack. So I said, well, let me train him for the makeover. You know, let me just, you know, he's never going to be sold, and he can be, you know, the very first horse that I restart from scratch. Right. And he, he was great. And um, we went to the makeover last year, and he, you know, we were pretty far behind where I was hoping to be going into the makeover because of... Um, a foot injury that he had kind of leading up to it at a really bad time and we missed all the competitions that I was hoping to get to before the makeover so it was actually his first um, big competition he was the makeover itself was the makeover itself um, and he had a little bit of first time in a dressage arena syndrome is what I call it um, and you know like for some reason they go in there and they're all by themselves and there's this big white you know chain or fence around it and they're le looking at all the cones and the flowers and the judge and you know it's just their first experience is always like a little bit of a wow so um but he jumped fantastically and he finished 12th out of i think over 100 horses i'd have to look that up again but he was he was great he was such a he's such a good jumper and so i decided you know what what is what is Aztec's life after the makeover going to be and I was like well I'll just make him Joe's sugar and he can just be his fun horse and he'll know how to jump and he I actually took him fox hunting after that after the makeover um so he could have that experience it was another <clears throat> I took Joe fox hunting you know not that he knows how to jump or anything but he came <laughs> first field fox hunting with me and he loves to do crazy cool. stuff like that so so now I have this horse for Joe and it's Joe's sugar and Joe's fun horse that's just an all-around you know the the great thing about training a horse for vending is you have so many different things that they learn how to do um, so that's you know that was what was really fun about that and you know one of the things <clears throat> I think that the Retired Racehorse Project has done such a fabulous job of exposing the horses and the breed to the equestrian sports people. But what we're working to do is expose the equestrian sports more to the racing people. And, you know, the racing people really appreciate when they find a horse a good home or when they, you know, it goes off into a second career, but a lot of people don't really know what that means and Joe from was, the racing side from the racing side and Joe was one of them I mean, he grew up he was racetrack on the top and the bottom side you know um, grew up on the racetrack that's really all he's ever known and so I don't think he really had a genuine appreciation for what I was doing until I trained his horse in the makeover and you know that now he really has been just so supportive of you know and he know he's learned of what I look for in the horses that are at the track so he'll like he'll know before I tell him which ones I like really <laughs> when we're at the track and so he know and he know and then you know he can also see their there's such great potential for them after the track that he knows you know you know he can now tell like when when's a good stopping point to where you know they're not they're not going to be injured and you know have things what, what can they we can race this horse a couple more times but do we really need to right exactly right. What, what are we going to get out of this horse racing where someone else couldn't get up that you know something out of them doing something else so it's really you know he has gained such an appreciation for the rrp and you know their mission and and their whole purpose and my whole 
new purpose. Um, so it's been really fun. You know, you said something, and, and I just have to throw this in, that how people in the horse world are so focused on where they are that they really don't see what's going on on the other side. Yeah, I mean, that goes for discipline to discipline. Hunters to jumpers, eventers to, you know, barrel racing, polo, all the different disciplines that the RRP showcases. I mean, people don't know anything about other mm -mm. disciplines. Um, and it's just because you're focused on what you're doing, you right, know? Right. And so the RRP's been great to, to really expose everybody to each other. But to open it up to the racetrack community so they're learning what can happen to right. these horses at the end of their right. career. And I the other part of that is, you know, showing them that they have value. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to give your horse away. You know, there's a plenty of people that are willing to pay money for a horse that's, I mean, a five-year-old who's sound and has a good brain. I mean, that's worth a lot of money. Right. I have to tell you, it, to, to kind of exemplify this point, I was at a, at a western horse farm in Shelbyville, Kentucky, heading home after working all day, and back into, into Louisville, and I was at this western farm, and I said, you know, I got enough time, I'm going to make one more stop on the way home, and I said, where's the next farm? And he said, well, leave my place, turn right, go down about a mile to the stop sign, turn left, take the first right, that's on the left. I said, great, that's what I'm, I'm going to do. I pulled out of his property, I turned right, and I looked up, and there's a barn. And I thought, well, what's going on here? So I turned up the driveway, got up there, it was a dressage bar. He was sending me to the Western, the right. next Western of course. bar. <laughs> of course, yeah, that's funny. Just so, yeah, so focused on what, the, well, you know, so I think it's really wonderful that you're going to expose the, the horse racing community to it. So let me ask you this, we do have a couple of calls. What is your process? You go to the track and you're seeing these horses. Tell me what's happening with your eye and your thought processes. <clears throat> Um, the, the, the main things that I look for are horses that have good confirmation mm -hmm. because, you know, that sort of um, represents their soundness and their potential for soundness. Um, good confirmation, good movement, the way that they move, um, you know, you can, you can tell by a horse's walk what sometimes their athleticism um, and, and, and a good brain. and. The good brain is what's so valuable because if you have a horse that is, you know, amateur friendly, that someone who's not a professional can train themselves and compete themselves, you know, there's a huge market for that. And that's what a lot of people are looking for. Um, so one of the best and most unique assets that I have is that I know everybody on the racetrack. Right. I know everybody. Right. I mean, if I don't know someone, I know someone who knows someone very well. Right. You know, um, and, and that's throughout the country. I mean, there's just so many connections that I have. So if there's anybody that has a horse that I'm interested in, I can go there and say, hey, can I get on it? And they'll talk to you and they'll let you get on. <laughs> right. And they, you know, they know who I am. They trust me. Um, I know who they are. I trust them. Um, and I can get on the horse and just, even if I don't, I mean, I like to go on the racetrack. That's really the only opportunity you have to ride the horse at the track is on the track. Um, or just trail ride them around the backside and see what their personality is like. You know, are they spooking at things? Are they nervous? Are they chill? Do they not care? Do they have, you know, like take them and do something that they don't normally do and see how they react to it even if it's just on the backside or if I you know take them into the chute and do a little figure eight how about how well balanced are they you know what is their what is their demeanor what is their um, disposition like and that is something that I value so much because I can tell really what tendency this horse might have once it leaves the track right and having said that once they leave the track they can turn into completely different horses and a lot of those horses that have that you know, more high-spirited um, personality, they kind of just chill out and they, you know, it's like when you take them off the track, you wipe the slate clean. But knowing what your starting point is, is like a huge um, benefit, I think. I, you've also got the luxury of being able to see them multiple times at the track in many cases, mm -hmm. right? And actually talking to the trainer or some of the people that have ridden the horse to give you a better depth right finding that. out the history of the right, horse right right and you know when you're when when someone comes up that is unfamiliar and they're asking you about your horse and they probably want it for free <laughs> you know right. i mean what are you likely to want to you know how much information are you going to give them um whereas you know people are familiar with me i'm coming up and saying you know what tell me about the horse you know and they they're just really 
uh, I think, open to giving me as much information as they have about the life. So do you, um, are you training primarily eventing and dressage type horses? Or what is your um, focus? My focus, what I prefer to do is eventing, but I, I have experience with hunters and jumpers. Um, there, you know, there are some horses that will come off the track and can have a jumping discipline um, future, but maybe they're not, you know, maybe they have an injury that would prevent them from going to a high level on cross country galloping and pounding. Um, that I have, you know, experience in dressage, experience in hunters, jumpers, fox hunting. I, I actually took a horse hunting. One of the horses that I um, competed in the eventing discipline of the makeover this year in 2018 was actually sold to um, a master of the foxhounds of Loudon Hunt in Leesburg, Virginia. And um, the, the buyer asked me if I would take him out hunting just, you know, just to see if he would like it. She, she asked me if he would like fox hunting. I said, well, how are you going to know until you take him out, right? So she asked me if I could take him out. I said, sure. So I went out with um, Long Run Woodford Hounds, and the horse was fabulous. And while I was, this is a horse that I trained for six months for eventing, and, you know, never never had been out hunting on him at all. He'd never right. been hunting. Um, but while I was out, and, you know, it, 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 it was most likely to be, an experience of green, schooling a green horse and you know usually they you know fox hunting is a very very big crazy atmosphere for for any horse especially race horse being a crowd of horses and galloping and stopping and jumping and doing all these things and hounds running around um so you know it takes a certain horse to be able to handle that situation and this horse was just I mean, he was like a seasoned hunt horse. He was really? just a joy for me to ride. I don't hunt much, but I enjoy it so much. And so this day, taking this horse out to school him as a green horse on the hunt field was like, we went, we started out in second field, which is where, you know, you're mostly like walk, trot, a little bit of galloping, but no jumping. And then first field is where you're, you know, you're right up close to the hounds and the master and you're, you know, you're right up there jumping everything, going everywhere, every which way. And, you know, halfway through, we ended up just going up first field because he was so good and he was so eager and, you know, really enjoying himself. And he's fabulous. And I decided this might be the best second life for racehorse <laughs> you know one that can handle that sort of atmosphere i mean it's just it's no pressure it's fun it's not necessarily competing but you know they're well trained and they just it's fun you know and, and i just think it must be one of the most enjoyable things for for that horse in particular it could not have been the more perfect place for him to go that's absolutely incredible so i'm hearing you tell me you have your interest your your eventing and your dressage and that type of thing which is where if you went to the track picked a horse that may be where you initially go but someone can come to you and say hey i've got this horse and i'm looking at it i'm going to jump or i'm going to do this they can consult with you Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I have a horse right now uh, in training um, where the owner is actually the, the owner who raced the horse um, and she has a, a breeding farm. And so she raced this horse. He raced. Um, he retired, I think, he when he was five. And he was actually restarted in eventing at that point, but only for about six weeks. He even made it to a couple of shows, like little uh, mini shows, you know, good local experiences for the horse. And then he was kind of ponying yearlings at the farm. He was kind of like sitting around doing nothing. And right. so she contacted me and she said, I have this horse. He's too nice to be sitting in the field. Would you like to come look at him, evaluate him, let me know what you think, um, possibly train him to sell him. I, I think this horse deserves to be doing something rather than sitting in a field and so um so i went to evaluate the horse and he's a fabulous horse and i and actually lo looking at him in the field i said fox hunting you know i think that's what he would i think he would love fox hunting and just you know knowing what his experiences were and and what his demeanor is and so he's in my barn now and we're kind of just doing a little bit of everything and trying to figure out what he wants to do and it's kind of a you know it's just all for the horse to find mm -hmm. him a good place to go and that's one of my main focuses is find a good place advocate the horse and its breed and the off-track thoroughbred while i'm training it and then find a buyer who will do the same thing so you've approached this now as a business as a second career if you will correct and and you've just launched your websites rosyofftrack.com yes correct? Is. is that right i think that's correct and it's a great website uh it's good look very very nice very nicely done and you present yourself well and and do a good job there so you've got to track the the website you have horses that are for sale Horses that you've trained. Uh, one of them you competed in this year's 
Two of them. Two of them. Two in of this them. year's... Uh, yeah, one of them has sold. Um, that would be our Emerald Forest is sold. He is the one that went to be a fox hunter. And there's um, there's another horse, I'm Already There, who's a five-year-old, and he um, actually finished third out of 95 horses in the eventing discipline at the makeover this year. Um, he's a very, very talented, upper-level event prospect. Right. Um, so he's still for sale, um, trying to... He's actually got a lot of good interest right now, um, but looking to find the person that will take him to his potential. Um, and that's, you know, my, one of my biggest and most important goals is to find the very right person for each horse. And that, and, and so how do you do that? How, how do you see this horse, see what it can be, and then now you talk to me? <laughs> well, you wanna... know, getting to know the horse and what his, what his capabilities are, what his limitations might be, right. um, and and who's going to ride this horse the best? Um, is it going to be an amateur that's going to jump around in a low level in the you know hunter jumper circuit? There's so many horses that would love to do that. As a matter of fact, um, my horse Sugar, um, I evented him to the training level, and once we got there, it was like okay, I could move up. He's 17 years old. I could move up to prelim. He, he's 17 years old. He has a condylar fracture in front, a condylar fracture behind, a suspensory, and an ankle chip. I mean, that's a laundry list of stuff. Mm -hmm. 17, all these injuries, loves what he does, loves competing. So I said to myself, should I take him to prelim or should I just let him go novice for the rest of his life? <laughs> and so that's what I did. And, you know, I had lots of young horses coming through, but this horse would love you know he is just an absolute novice packer and is currently being leased by a girl who was moving up off a pony up to a horse for the first time and is absolutely in love with him so there's i mean there's so many off track thoroughbreds that have that you know play around at a low level and just be happy and you know that is so fun to see them do that so we've and taken so fun for those riders uh, exactly we've taken off track thoroughbred from the point of uh, over the years i know people have trainers have given horses to people that become trail horses and, and all of that but we're really stepping it up now oh yeah to, to where they're retraining them for second careers oh yeah which, which is the deal we do have a question if i let me try this and see uh, if jason uh, i believe it's jason bill uh, he's a, one of our practitioners. Well, we're going to see if he's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have another question for you here. Is that Jason? Yeah, Jason. Yes, sir. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good, Mr. Pratt. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're here with Rosie Napravnik. Did you have a question for Rosie? Actually, I was just I I just uh, love hearing a story. I mean, that's just that's amazing. Uh, to be, you know, running out there and winning that first flat race at 17 years old. I just, uh, that was just, I mean, that's just cool. I mean, that's just, you know, not everybody gets that kind of chance of a lifestyle and, and, uh, to, to be able to launch a career like that. And I just, I just wanted to commend you and, 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 and congratulate you on, on such a success. Thank you. And you know what? You're right. Not, not everybody has those opportunities. I was very, very blessed to be supported by the people that I was supported by and, and have those experiences to get me that, to give me the foundation I had before I ever rode my first race, because that was that was what led to success. Exactly, and Jason, Jason's a farrier. Uh, Jason, wh have you seen what have you seen happening with the thoroughbreds coming through where you're at? I'll tell you, uh, a lot of thoroughbreds that come down in this area, the rehab thoroughbreds, and um, <clears throat> you know, of course, a lot of them, you know, they get down in this part of the country, and and I don't know what it is down here. I blame it on the environment and everything else, but the feet just go to snot. I mean, they just. I'm, I'm trying to be nice. Uh, the feet just go to trash, and I see a lot of uh, you know a lot of your thoroughbreds are coming down, and they're 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 tightened up, they're sore, they're hurt somewhere because they you know hurt themselves on the track or wasn't you know wasn't cared for properly or whatever the case may be. And uh, so we we do see a lot of the thoroughbreds come down here on the rehab on the re, re, you know out of some of the rehabs and some of the uh, uh, what do you call them. Uh, people that uh after layup aftercare layup yeah yeah lay, lay up and aftercare and they uh so anyway they uh we we get down here and i've i've got quite a few of them that, that move over into the uh, hunter jumper area and the dressage area and i get called out i don't shoot a lot of hunter jumpers i probably do oh out of 300 head every six weeks i probably do 80 hunter jumpers and uh so i don't do a whole lot of hunter jumpers uh 
I do I do some dressage and I also but I magna wave a lot of them. I mean that's where magna wave really really helps these guys out. And uh, I've actually seen a lot of them start calming down after about the second or third treatment and just really starting to pay attention and really enjoy life, uh, you know, after, after we start the MagnaWave sessions with them. So. There you go. Now, I didn't pay you for that endorsement. So, uh. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks for, thanks for the comments. We appreciate it. You bet. You all have a good day. Uh-huh. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. You know, it's interesting. And he said it, and my farrier said it, and I, I never, like, thought of it that way, but... My farrier said something, he's like, you know, it's really kind of, it's challenging, but it's fun sometimes to transition these horses' feet off the track. And that's a huge thing, is transitioning their feet. It's one of the big main things, no foot, no horse. Um, but all the thoroughbreds on the track just go through that pounding, 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 pounding every day. Have you seen the slow motion video of a horse's foot on the racetrack? Yes. It's incredible, it's incredible. how they hit and turn. Mm -hmm. I mean the pressure and, the, and everything that goes. Right and so they're just at the mercy of you know the train the daily training and the galloping all the time um, and you know some of them come off with with pretty decent feet and a lot of them come off and have to go through that process of right. transitioning but even the horses that don't have great feet or have thin soles or you know tender soles like their feet can get so much better by just letting them grow out and giving them a little bit of time to you know and i mean even through training and both the horses i trained this year um had actually pretty decent feet and the one horse needed to grow out you know a, what was like a crack in the foot that needed you know to just give it time to like a couple of cycles to get that to grow out and his feet are great so um, that's one thing that they, you know, farriers are transitioning these horses that's to. That's right. That's right. And when he said that, it made me laugh because my farrier said that as well. So, say it. Said the same thing. I do want to make a transition here, but I, there was another question that was asked, and I'm not trying to. I almost didn't want to ask the question, but Jason kind of alluded to it, and you are uh, on our MagnaWave team here. That Terry asked the question a few minutes ago. What led you to us? What led you to MagnaWave as as an aid for your horses and Joes or whatever? I actually was introduced to MagnaWave when I was a jockey, and I had injured my foot. I actually, um, I had a horse rear up uh, so high I had to jump off so he didn't flip over. And I, when I landed, I landed straight on my two feet and rolled both of my ankles. And I had two sprained ankles and two bruised heels to the point mm. where I didn't have a good foot to limp on. Oh my. So, um, and I was desperate. It was actually when I was riding Believe You Can, and I didn't want to take any time off because I was afraid they wouldn't think that I was in good enough shape to ride her in the oaks so i didn't take any time off um but that's when i was introduced to magnawave and the healing process the healing time was incredible um it was actually a trainer who came to me and said hey why don't you try this and so i did and the healing time was amazing and and then i think it was probably about a year later um or maybe even I can't remember the timeline, but when Joe started working for Mike Maker, and Mike 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 bought a machine. Mike bought a machine, and um, so he had it. And you know, I didn't use it a whole lot. I would use it a couple of times when I really had something bothering me. But I wish I had a machine, or the jock room had a machine when I was riding, because my career probably would have lasted longer. I mean, there's so many times as a jockey. I mean my husband can tell you how much pain I was always in I and mean, it's just constant constant stress and and pressure on your body and um, I, I mean I had trouble sleeping and I and I just I think back about it now when I'm using my MagnaWave on myself and I think boy my career might have been five ten years longer <laughs> you know if I if I had been utilizing this right all through you know especially those last years of my career well we can you know you can get back on tomorrow yeah, no. <laughs> I could but there's a lot of other things I know a lot of other reasons too thank you I think that that's a great but, great share but having and then you know when we started you know partnering up and working together last year when I started to retrain these horses um, it, it's just perfect for the horses transition you know they're 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 coming off from being these just fit as can be athletes where you know and they have all this muscle memory and to get that to just smooth out and kind of you know let them come down from being so tight and so fit um and retraining the muscles you know i mean it's, it's a process like you know i compare when you start to do flat work with a horse who has no flat work right or a horse that's even been fit as can be on the racetrack but has never been taught how to move his body in this particular way i compare it to going like to work out with a personal trainer 
You know, like he says, do 10 push-ups. And so you get down and do 10 push-ups. Okay, no big problem. I'm fit. And then he readjusts your body to the proper way to do a push-up. Right, and says, right. okay, do three push-ups. And you struggle <laughs> to get that done. That's how I would compare, you know, bringing a horse into flat work for the first time. And so, you know, I just am constantly relating the MagnaWave to myself when I MagnaWave my horses. And in the levels that I do it, in the areas that I do it, and the, the intervals that I do it. Um, and so it's just, you know, for ho any horse or human in the equine industry has got to be exposed to this. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, let's change gears. we got just a few minutes here. Um, let's, let's put a different hat on if we can and talk Breeders' Cup for just a second. Uh, you're our analyst uh, for Breeders' Cup. The world is, is watching. What do you see happening this year? Do you see anything developing that, that's different? Do you see anything that's, uh, anything that's obvious? Other than Joe Sars, we know those are going to win. <laughs> well, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm a terrible analyst because I don't know all the details of many of the horses and I'm have been so consumed with my horses and the right. makeover leading right. up to this Breeders' Cup season that I'm, you know, I'm out of the loop with Breeders' Cup, but I do know that I have ridden Moms on Strike, Joe's horse, all last winter, and she is one of the most fabulous athletes. She's actually, you know, when we, we get the horses off the track that, you know, are done racing for one reason or another, but if we could just go onto the track and select any thoroughbred that we wanted, <laughs> <laughs> we right. could really do well, you know. Right. Um, but she's one of those horses. I mean, she is just absolutely um, an athlete, and her mind is incredibly focused, and she's just such a cool horse. She's doing really well. Um, Joe actually came and, and um, told me that he um, – he went in, in her final breeze for the Breeders' Cup. He said it's the best breeze she's ever had in her life. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but I'm, I'm really sorry that I don't have racing form. I haven't looked at a race because it's only Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I, I'll have to study up on it before we... Maybe we can come back at another time and talk about what happened. And you there can you give go. us and some thoughts. And I can thoughts. give you lots of analysis about right, that. Right, right. One thing, real quick, that was really interesting at the EquestraCon was... Uh, Woodbines exhibit where they had the oh, yes. virtual I reality. Am so disappointed. Oh. I didn't go back and put the machine on, but I watched. Um, they had the TV screen of uh, Emma Jane Wilson was wearing this helmet cam, and, and she was there. No. I, I didn't see her. She was there the day before I was oh, okay. there. Okay, okay. But um, she's a good friend and a fantastic rider, and I love Emma. Um, but I watched, I was able to see the video, and it was such a cool race because it was a come from behind race on the turf where she went, she weaved through, went through the inside, came to the outside. It was like one of the, you know, one of those races where you're like, yes, 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 you know, when right. you make all the right moves. Right. And um, so it was really cool that she went on to, and to win that race. And But I watched it on the TV screen while somebody else was watching it with those, you know, glass, Goggles. glasses yeah. on. And it was just so funny to watch. And I meant to go back and do it. And I just... But someone commented, time. and then we're going to go, I know you got places you have to be. Someone made the comment that they were listening to her describe what was happening. Right. And it gave them such a different view of the race. They're sitting there thinking, you know, they're watching, well, I need to go out. There's a place to go. There's a place to do this. But to hear her describing what she was... And I'm sure you could share that same type oh, yeah. of story. What she was going in right, her mind. Right, because the jockey's thinking about 100 yards ahead. Yes. You know, yeah. as yeah. opposed to what you're doing right now yeah incredible it was really well, it was Rosie, fun to watch. I want I want to thank you for being with us it's rosieofftrack.com for her website it's excellent if you're interested in in how to repurpose off the track thoroughbreds and you just want to know more about it rosieofftrack.com uh, take a look at it. if you have questions for Rosie there's a way to contact her and talk about uh, repurposing uh, thoroughbreds thank you very much for being with us Thanks, it's always Pat. a pleasure to to it visit with always you always a pleasure to visit with the magnwave team there you go thank you so much. Andrew, maybe you can play her video one more time and then uh, the exit.